or about half of it. So I guess that's just the half that's for me tonight. We won't try to sing it. <laughs> it's simply talking about in the presence of the Lord, there's fullness of joy. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad that we can get into the presence of the Lord and feel the joy of the Holy Ghost? I'm not going to try to sing. Sister Carter, we'll get right into the word of the Lord tonight. Appreciate your faithfulness to the house of God. Amen. I was standing in line at the funeral home tonight, and and uh, well, let's just go ahead and read the scripture while you're standing, and then I'll I'll tell my story. Amen. This side was ahead of this side. Hallelujah. I'd give you a popsicle, but I don't have any. <laughs> <coughs> I could give you an attaboy or at a girl. <laughs> Amen. Uh, but. Acts chapter 2, beginning of verse number 1, and we'll read verses 1 through 4. And I know a lot of the things that I'll be teaching tonight, I preached about Sunday morning. Um, the difference, main difference between teaching and preaching is the preaching deals with the emotions, and teaching deals with the intellect. That's why a lot of times when uh, someone asks you on Sunday morning what the preacher preached about Sunday night, we can't remember because it, it dealt with our emotions at the moment in time. But sometimes when we hear teaching of the Word of God, it sticks with us a while. And we can, we can recall Bible studies, but sometimes preaching, <coughs> I used to take offense and nobody remember what I preach about, but then I realized sometimes I forget what I preached about. So uh, that's kind of bad. I can't, feel, I can't feel bad about somebody not remembering if I can't remember. Uh, but uh, <coughs> uh, so... A lot of the things that maybe was preached about Sunday, we weren't able to grab a hold of uh, or have forgotten about. So we're going to talk about uh, what God has done Sunday. This past Sunday was Pentecost Sunday. Yes. Amen. Had a great service Sunday morning. The presence of the Lord was here. Yes. Amen. Appreciate uh, our Facebook ministry, YouTube ministry. Uh, I noticed just before service that the message that I preached last Sunday morning on uh, the day of Pentecost uh, was viewed 153 times, or 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 uh, wretch 153 people. Now I don't know if 153 people actually sit down and listen to it, but at least reached them, uh, and uh, we're sa we're thankful for that. Uh, uh, so we're we're believing that God is. I told my wife. Well, let me read the scripture. Acts chapter 2, keep you in suspense, what I told my wife. Beginning of verse number 1, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared in them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Amen. With the help of the Lord, I'm going to teach again tonight another Bible study in the book of Acts. Let's lift our hands one more time and love the Lord Jesus. We love you with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Thank you, Lord, for the faithfulness of your people. Thank you, Lord, for the anointing of the word of God. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for the preciousness of the word. We ask you to anoint the ears and the hearts of the listeners tonight that we might hear and receive the word of the Lord. God, anoint your servant one more time that I might speak the words of God as you've given them to me. In the name of Jesus Christ, we're so thankful today, so thankful today for your mercy and your grace. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. May the Lord bless you. You may be seated tonight in Jesus' name. Now, back to what I was telling my wife. Uh, has nothing to really do about our Bible study, uh, but we were standing in line at the funeral home this evening and <clears throat> and there was some older folk behind me I didn't realize they was older but but after we had viewed the body and I, I made a, uh, a point to turn around to see who was talking they were talking about Brother Cottrell uh, preaching revival and, and them getting the Holy Ghost or there was some that got the Holy Ghost and we got in the car and we headed down or headed toward the church and I told my wife I said you know what I'd like to be able to do? I don't know whether we could ever pull it off or not I don't really know how we could do it, but I'd like to be able to put an advertisement in the paper and just broadcast it across the county of Ward County and say, we're going to have a special service. And if you've ever had the Holy Ghost or if you've ever received the Holy Ghost, 
we'd like for you to be at that service. I would like to know how many people in this county, and I believe that there's more than you and I would ever imagine that have received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Now, do they still have it? I don't know. But I'd like to know, uh, I'd like to be able to, to uh, get everybody together that's had the Holy Ghost. And uh, I think that we'd, we would be interested in knowing that. I believe that there's people that we rub shoulders with during the course of a day, course of a week. We may, we may bump into them at the Piggly Wiggly or Dick's Market, and, and we don't know the fact that they had the Holy Ghost or have the Holy Ghost just like you and I have. Amen. Now, they may not have full truth. Amen. They may not be living like we live and, and, uh, and whole, embrace holiness like we embrace holiness, uh, but they had the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Amen. The disciples uh, was trying to hush a bunch of people down using the name of Jesus, and they, they felt like they were the ones that had the authority to use the name of Jesus, and, and he, they even approached the Lord and said, Lord, tell them to be quiet. Jesus said, if they're, if they're for us, they're not against us. Amen. So that's just something that I, I thought of this evening. Now, let's get into the word of the Lord. The pinnacle of the plan of salvation, the, uh, the main thing of salvation is the infilling of the Holy Ghost. Now, I know that there's four steps. We talked about it Sunday. There's four steps uh, in the plan of salvation. You've got to have faith. You've got to believe that the Lord is and that he will reward those that diligently seek him. And by faith, we approach an altar of repentance and ask him, by faith, to forgive us of our sins. And we know that Jesus Christ is faithful to forgive us of all of our sins. Amen. I'm so thankful tonight that he is a forgiver uh, of sins. <clears throat> and then baptism in the name of Jesus Christ, uh, and then the infilling of the Holy Ghost. So, uh, but the, the cornerstone, the pinnacle of the plan of salvation is the infilling of the Holy Ghost, Jesus living inside of us. Faith, repentance, water baptism is important. It's necessary. They're not options. You've got to do it. Amen. But those three steps only prepare the vessel, amen, to receive the Holy Ghost. You can't get the Holy Ghost until you repent it. You can't do it. You can't get the Holy Ghost until you have faith. Now, there are some people that receive the Holy Ghost before they're baptized, uh, but <clears throat> those three steps, repentance or faith, repentance, and water baptism is preparing you for the infilling of the Holy Ghost because it is the Holy Spirit of God. If you're reading the Old Testament, any time that which was unholy touched that which was holy, it would corrupt the holy. So God, being a Holy Spirit and being a holy God, amen, has to purify the vessel that he's getting ready to enter into or therefore uh, the Holy Ghost would be contaminated. So faith, repentance, water baptism, uh, repentance produces a clean heart. Amen. It gives you a fresh start. All things that you have done in your past. Amen. You ask Jesus to forgive you of it and the Lord will forgive you. But repentance and forgiveness of sin alone cannot lift us into the place that we need to be with God. It takes something more than that. Everything from Genesis to the book of Acts was to bring about the outpouring or the infilling of the Holy Ghost in the hearts of men and women. Amen. Jesus was approached by the Pharisees or the scribes of that day, and he told them, he says, I have not come to destroy the law, but he said, I've come to fulfill the law. He meant, in other words, what he was simply saying was everything that the law was talking about, everything that the prophets pointed to is in me. I am the answer to all old-time prophecies concerning the coming Messiah. He meant, he said, I didn't come to destroy the law, but I have come to fulfill the law. While the death of Jesus at Calvary was the ultimate sacrifice for sin, forgiveness in itself is not enough to bring us to the place where we need to be with God. Again, repentance produces a clean heart. Amen. There's nothing like the feeling of being forgiven. Even if you 
uh, have an odd against a brother or sister and you make it right over the course of time and, and they forgive you and you forgive them, there is a feeling that comes over you, a clean feeling to know that, that whatever it was between the two of you is all better. It's taken care of. And so it is probably magna, magna, or multiplied even more uh, when we ask Jesus to forgive us, forgive us of our sins against him. Water baptism in the name of Jesus Christ remits sin. Amen. It washes away your sin. Every sin that you've ever committed in your lifetime that you repented for and you go down in the name of Jesus Christ in water, when you come up out of the water, amen, your slate is clean. Every sin that you've ever committed from a child to present, amen, has been washed completely away. Amen. It does a better job of removing sin stains than tide does grass stain. Hallelujah. Amen. The red blood of Jesus Christ through baptism will wash away the sins that you've committed. But it's the Holy Ghost that completes the new birth experience. Amen. It's, it's the Holy Ghost that will give you a new life. You are not a new creature in Christ Jesus because you repent. You're not a new creature in Christ Jesus because you have faith. You're not a new creature in Christ Jesus because that you have been baptized in his name. But you become a new creature in Christ Jesus when the Holy Ghost infills you and, and fills you up. That's when you begin to say, the old man has passed away and behold, all things have become new. Jesus laid the old body in the tomb, amen, after the crucifixion, but on Resurrection Sunday, amen, when he came out of the tomb, he had a new body. Matter of fact, in the garden, he told him, don't touch me because I don't have my glorified body yet. I, I, you can't touch me. So there is a new creature that comes out of the Holy Ghost. Jesus explained it to Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a ruler of the Jews and he came to the Lord by night and said, Lord, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus looked at him and said, you gotta be born again. And it confused Nicodemus. Nicodemus said, Lord, how can I, being an old man, be born again? Can I enter back into my mother's womb and be born again? And Jesus was simply telling him, I paraphrase it, you don't understand what I'm talking about, Nicodemus. You don't have to enter back into your mother's womb, but you've got to be born again of water and spirit. New birth is a double uh, sided thing. You've got to be born of water, which is baptism in the name of Jesus Christ, and you've got to be born of spirit, which is the infilling of the Holy Ghost. Forgiveness comes through repentance, and cleaning us comes through water baptism, and the life or the new life in Jesus Christ comes through receiving the Holy Ghost. So the process of salvation is incomplete without baptism of the water, and baptism of the Spirit. can't have one without the other. Uh, when you are baptized of the Spirit, it's when you receive the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost in the Bible has been prophesied for a long time. One of the things that the Holy Ghost is described as is a promise. Amen. You shall receive the promise of the Holy Ghost. You can receive the promise of of the comforter, one of the great promises of God was that he promised to put the Holy Ghost into every man or every woman that repents. Amen. If you'll remember, the Bible says that it's not his will that any should perish, but that all would come to what? To come to repentance. And when you repent of your sins, you open up the fallow ground of your heart for the Holy Ghost to come in. Amen. Amen. Acts chapter 1, verse 5, the Bible says, For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. We read it Sunday, but let me read again tonight, Joel chapter 2, verse 28 and 29, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and also upon thy servants and upon the handmaid in those days will I pour out my spirit. Amen. Acts chapter 2 verse 39. For the promise is unto you. Promise of the Holy Ghost. It is unto you or it's for you. It's for your children and to all that are far off even as many as the Lord 
our God shall call. Hallelujah. Aren't you thankful for the promise of the Holy Ghost? Amen. Aren't you thankful that you received the promise of the Holy Ghost? Amen. When somebody promises you something and you have an expectation for it and you look forward to receiving that promise, there's a feeling that comes over you even in the natural when somebody fulfills a promise and provides you with the promise that was made. Amen. Again, even more so should receiving the Holy Ghost, the promise of God upon the lives of men and women, when receive the Holy Ghost, what a wonderful feeling. Hallelujah. We hear of people talking about the feeling they receive when they're baptized in Jesus' name. Amen. When they go down the water and we call upon them the name of Jesus Christ and they come up out of the water, I've had many people describe it many ways. A lot of people says it just feels like a heavy weight lifts off of them. Amen. What it is is simply, amen, the, 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 uh, the sins, that, the weight of sin or the burden of sin that had burdened you down, amen, is being lifted off of you, amen, through the power of the name of Jesus Christ. It's not in the water. It's not the water. Oh, that's just tap water back there. Amen. It wasn't enough, Sister Cindy, to save a cricket. Hallelujah. But it can certainly wash our sins away. Just to send the and Brother Daniel know what I'm talking about. Hallelujah. It'll wash your sins away. Amen. We don't add anything to it. It's not holy water. Hallelujah. It's just good old Elizabeth tap water that's probably overchlorinated. That's, that's, that's all that's in there. Hallelujah. But when we call on the name of Jesus Christ in baptism, something begins to happen from the time you go under till the time you come up. Every sin that's been committed is washed completely away. I don't know if we really grasp that or not tonight. Amen. But completely washed away. The Bible says he takes the sins that you've committed and removes them as far as the east is from the west. You can't get any farther than as far as the east is from the west. Because you can start tonight and start traveling west and you never reach east. You're still going west. Hallelujah. Amen. We talk about the sins going into the sea of forgetfulness where they're never to be remembered against us anymore. Hallelujah. I don't care how bad or how much big of a scoundrel you was before baptism. Amen. In the eyes of Jesus Christ, you're a newborn babe. You're as white as snow. Amen. God's purpose for sending the Holy Ghost was to affect the world. How was he going to affect the world, preacher? He was going to affect the world through transformation and regeneration. Transformation takes place when the old man dies in an altar of repentance and a new man begins at salvation. That's a transformation. Amen. People come to an altar of repentance, a sinner. I've seen them come that it was, was bound by addictions and, and God begins to move upon them and they forgive. They ask God forgive us. Somebody posted on Facebook. It might have been a Brother Henry's church. I think if I remember right, they left a can of skull uh, snuff on the altar. They were leaving their addiction at the altar. And I've seen him. Uh, Noah Cottrell, he's went on to his reward, but uh, got the Holy Ghost when he was 82 years old at a youth revival of all places. Hallelujah. Amen. And had chewed tobacco since I believe he said he was 14 years old. And he was 82 when God filled him with the Holy Ghost. But when God filled him with the Holy Ghost, there was a transformation come over him. Hey Amen. You're talking about being addicted for uh, my math not being too good, but uh, about 68 years chewing tobacco. But he never chewed tobacco after he received the Holy Ghost. It was a transformation. I've seen drug addicts. I've seen alcoholics. I've seen people that were liars, cheaters, and stealers, and all those things, and God transforms them in an altar of repentance. You are here tonight, and you've, you know that transformation. I am not the man that I used to be. Amen. I thank God every day that I'm not the man that I could have been. Amen. But because of the transformation that come over me, amen, my life has taken a new direction. Paul, again, said, the things that I used to hate, I now love, and the things that I used to love, I now hate. He's talking about the transformation that happens when you receive the Holy Ghost. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And then he uses regeneration, which is a spiritual renewal or 
a revival. Something that was dead is now alive. He said to about sinners, he said, you are dead yet while you live. Amen. The Holy Ghost breathes a new life in you. Amen. We are not the same. We look the same. We sound the same. We live in the same place. We like the same foods. We work at the same job, go to the same school. Amen. Live in the same family. Everything on the outside appears to be the same, but oh, what a change in my life. Hallelujah. Amen. The song we sing that says, Jesus on the inside, working on the outside. Oh, what a change in my life. Hallelujah. Aren't you thankful for the change? In verse number two, the scripture says that on the day of Pentecost, chapter one, the Bible says that when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were in one accord in one place. And the Bible says in verse two, suddenly there came a sound from heaven, the lack is of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the room where they were sitting. It didn't say a wind filled the room, but they said that there was a sound that filled the room. And it sounded, the appearance of the sound sounded like a mighty wind or a strong wind. If they had curtains on the window, I don't believe that the curtains rustled. But there was a sound, there was something going on. They realized something was happening. The Bible says that there was some 120 believers that were in that upper room. And all, the Bible says, when that sound came, when they began to hear the sound, the Bible says that the Holy Ghost appeared. Like as a cloven tongues, like as a fire. It didn't say a fire. We've seen pictures of people getting the Holy Ghost in the upper room and there's a little, a little campfire on top of their head. Amen. There was no fire, but it was like a fire. It was a consuming, it was a burning sensation that, that consumed them. And the Bible says all 120 believers... Now, just in our simple education, all means everyone. I believe when it said all were filled, 120 people in the upper room that was there received the Holy Ghost. And the Bible says that when they began to receive the Holy Ghost, the Bible says they began to speak in another tongue as the Spirit gave them utterance. Hallelujah. That simply means it was that it means is that the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost that was filling them was doing the speaking. The Holy Ghost gave utterance. It was the one that was speaking. When you begin to speak in an unknown tongue, when you receive the Holy Ghost, amen, it's the Holy Spirit of God using your vocal cords, using your uh, tongue, using your mouth, and it's speaking words through you. Hallelujah. You don't learn how to speak in tongues. I'm not going to teach you how to speak in tongues. I couldn't if I could. He meant I can barely speak English. I'm surprised y'all didn't say amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. You don't learn how to speak in tongues. There are people that will have classes and, and they'll, they'll instruct a person in altar, here's what you need to say. And when they begin to repeat after them, they, get the, they, they say, you got the Holy Ghost. I, I'm a firm believer in this one thing about the Holy Ghost. When you get the Holy Ghost, nobody has to tell you. Hallelujah. Nobody had to come and say, young man, you got the Holy Ghost, <coughs> Holy Ghost tonight. Hallelujah. Man, I knew something happened to me that night when I was an 11-year-old boy. <clears throat> Hallelujah. It's not by coincidence that God chose to show the unbeliever <clears throat> that the Holy Ghost had come by using the only thing that man cannot tame. Amen. The only thing that we cannot control. Some people have trouble controlling their temper. The reason you have trouble controlling your temper is because you can't control your tongue. If you could control your tongue, people wouldn't know that you had a temper. <clears throat> Hello. Amen. James chapter 3, verse number 8, But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Wouldn't it be nice if we could just grasp a hold of that scripture? Wouldn't it be nice if everybody could just understand that? Hallelujah. It is full of deadly poison. 
amen, I, I'm always amazed when somebody says, uh, says something and is offensive or hurts somebody, and then they say, well, I didn't mean that. Well, you did mean that. Yeah. Hallelujah. You might regret saying it, but you meant it at the time because the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Hallelujah. And you can't take your words back. They say, well, I take that back. You can't do that once it's out. Amen. It's just like going to court, and the court, the judge says, you need to, uh, the, the jury needs to strike that testimony. Well, they, they can't put that out of their memory. Them lawyers know that. <clears throat> Man, so he cho or he's chosen the tongue to use as an instrument to announce the arrival of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. All these events transpired in the Bible says that it was noised abroad which means that it was a loud noise coming out of the upper room. Sometimes we try to contain what we feel and we, we don't want to be, I don't, I don't want to be a part of a loud church preacher. You would have felt awful out of place in the upper room. <sighs> Hallelujah. Amen. It was noised abroad and on the outside, amen, as the noise was permeating the upper room, because of this noise, there had gathered a crowd, and the Bible says, if you, you can read it and, and, <clears throat> and count them, there were 15 different nations with different dialects that was represented on the outside of that upper room. Remember, it was a day of Pentecost. There was a tremendous feast going on in the city of celebration. And there was 15 different nationalities, 15 different dialects that was there. <clears throat> Amen. And, and here's an interesting point that the Bible says that uh, these 15 nations that were represented on the outside had heard the 120 believers on the inside speak a language that they understood. Hallelujah. You know, for the longest time as a child, I thought that when you spoke in tongues, nobody understood what you were saying. But as I got older and realized, hey, man, that unknown tongue is a tongue that you don't know. It's a language that you don't know. Hallelujah. I've heard missionaries talk and testify about people getting the Holy Ghost over in the mission fields that have no idea how to speak English. And when God fills them with the Holy Ghost, they begin to speak in fluent English. Imagine a missionary hearing that for the first time. Amen. You can imagine uh, you talking about the Holy Ghost goose, goosebumps. Amen. It would, your, their Holy Ghost goosebumps probably had goosebumps. Hallelujah. The term unknown, unknown tongue does not mean that when you speak in tongues it is unknown to man, but it means it's unknown to you. If you know Spanish and you begin to speak Spanish and you say, I got the Holy Ghost, you probably didn't get the Holy Ghost. You just got an A in Spanish class. <clears throat> Amen. But it's a language that you don't know. Verses 14 through verse number 36 was the first Pentecostal message of the New Testament church. I was thinking today about being called apostolic and being called Pentecostal. Amen. I am apostolic by doctrine. I live and preach and embrace the doctrine of the apostles and those that preached uh, the New Testament salvation. Amen. I am Pentecostal by experience. I have received the Holy Ghost. Amen. I've been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and I stand as a witness this evening to tell you that when I got the Holy Ghost as an 11-year-old boy, I began to speak in a language that I didn't understand what I was saying. And it was a sign to me and those that are around me that that little ordinary preacher's kid at 11 years old in a storefront in Elizabeth, West Virginia got the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. And nobody has ever had to, and nobody has ever tried or been able to convince me otherwise. I know I've got the Holy Ghost. Amen. The song says, I've got the Holy Ghost down inside my soul, just like the Bible says. Hallelujah. Verse number 14 is a very important scripture that I want to bring to you tonight. It's a very powerful scripture to use when you're trying to discuss to an unbeliever the correct mode of baptism. We talked about it Sunday. How we got to be baptized, preacher. Amen. Peter said, 
Uh, it was Peter and, 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 and at least 10 of the other apostles. Matthias wasn't maybe not with the apostles when Jesus spoke to them in Matthew 28, 19 and said, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. But when Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, he said, baptize in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Very important, very powerful. Amen. The Bible says that they, the, the 11 stood with Peter. That was, a, that was symbolic of the unity amongst the brethren. They were standing in agreement with what Peter was preaching. And when Peter brought his altar call about and he said, listen, men and brethren, amen, you've crucified Jesus Christ. And the Bible says this brought conviction upon the crowd. On the outside of the upper room, it brought conviction. The Bible says, uses the word, they were pricked in their heart. They realize what they did. And at the end of Peter's message, the question was asked to Peter and the other 11 apostles. Again, remember, 11 stood with him. Men and brethren, what must we do to be saved? If Peter was not saying what Jesus told him to say, at least one of the apostles would have said, Peter, that's not what Jesus said. As I said Sunday, if you believe that we're to baptize in the titles Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost and that, and, and that Peter was off base when he was preaching, baptizing them in the name of Jesus Christ, you have to believe that it was one of the greatest conspiracies ever happened to mankind happened in the upper room when all 12 of these men got together and said, I know Jesus said to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, but I'm going to baptize in the name of Jesus. If that was not what Jesus instructed them to do, one of the apostles would have either stood up and said, Peter, that's not what Jesus said, or one of the apostles would have said, I'm not going to have no part in this. This is not what Jesus said and would have left the group. But because they stood together, Peter preached what Jesus told them. The name of the Father, amen, is Jesus. Isaiah chapter 9 and 6, his name shall be called Everlasting Father. Matthew chapter 2 tells us that the name of the Son is Jesus. And John, I believe it is, I don't know the scripture right off, says that uh, uh, the, Jesus says, I'm going to send you the Holy Ghost in my name. The name of the Holy Ghost is Jesus. Hallelujah. If we, truly want apost if we truly want to be apostolic, we need to be more concerned about feeling convicted instead of feeling good. Amen. We're living in a generation when preachers want their congregation to leave the churches feeling good about themselves. I don't know about you, but I want God to convict me. Amen. I like churches when I can go to church and I don't feel good about myself. Hallelujah. Even after we receive the Holy Ghost, there should be times when the presence of the Lord makes us feel uncomfortable when we hear the preaching of the Word of God. Hallelujah. Amen. It ought to, it ought to make us feel uncomfortable. We have a problem when we no longer feel conviction. Amen. The response to Peter's message was, men and brethren, what must we do? Acts chapter 2, verse 38 then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sin, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The message of the church has not changed since the day that the apostle Peter first preached it. It's not changed. Hallelujah. Jesus said, I change not. You believe that scripture? Jesus said, I change not. That means that if he's not changed then his word is the same because he said, my word is forever settled in heaven. Now, now stay with me just a little bit longer. So if Jesus Christ is the same and his word is the same and his promises are the same, then it just makes common sense to me that his plan is the same. Hello? Hello? If the question is the same, the answer is the same. Hallelujah. 
Anyone that gives you a different answer to the question, men and brethren, what must I do to be saved? Amen. They don't understand the question. When I was in school and it was come test time, uh, there was questions that I knew and I was able to answer correctly. There were some questions that I just flat didn't know and I got them wrong. And then there were questions on the test that I didn't understand the question. And the majority of the times when I tried to guess at those questions, I'd get them wrong because I didn't understand the question. And friend, if somebody tells you that you can be saved some other way than what Peter said on the day of Pentecost, they obviously do not understand the question and they got it wrong. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Amen. Aren't you thankful that you're following the apostles' doctrine? Amen. Verse 39 says, the promise is to you, to your children, to those that are far off. It's the, it is to who the Lord is going to call. And I said Sunday morning, I have not seen any biblical reference where God has stopped calling people. People, I can announce to you tonight with an assurity that people are still receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. And when they receive the Holy Ghost, they're still speaking in an unknown tongue. There's still people that's being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Hallelujah. The Bible says to save yourself from this untoward generation. Friend, I want you to understand, you're going to have to make a concerted effort if you're ever going to be saved. Some people tend to depend upon the preacher to keep them on the straight and narrow road. God called me to be a preacher. He didn't call me to be a babysitter. Hello? Amen. Some churches, have, to some churches it's become a, you've heard me say this before, it's become a, a game of pastor says instead of Simon says. If pastor doesn't tell me to pray, then I, I don't pray. If the pastor doesn't encourage me to fast, then I'm not going to fast. If if pastor doesn't challenge me to worship, I'm just going to come and just go through the motions and go home feeling good about myself being in church. If, if pastor doesn't stress the importance of reading my Bible and being faithful, then I don't need to read my Bible and I don't need to be faithful because if pastor doesn't say, I may have to go back to the back row and start all over again. People don't feel like they can do it on their own. But I'm here to tell you, if you're going to be saved, if you're going to be saved, it's going to be more about what you do than what about the pastor says. Hello. Pastor delivers how to be saved. Amen. Pastor counsels when counseling is needed. Pastor will preach and teach Bible studies as he feels in the, led in the Holy Ghost. But it's you that's going to have to make the choice. It's going to be you to make the decision. Amen. I'm going to serve the Lord. If mama don't go, it's not going to hinder me. If daddy doesn't live it, I'm going to keep on serving the Lord. Amen. If my family refuses salvation, I'm going to be faithful to God. Amen. Because I'm going to do everything I can to be ready to meet Jesus when he comes. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Finally tonight, verse 46 and 47 is the place where the church needs to get to. <clears throat> the Bible says that in verse number 47, when the church gets to the place that we need to be, Amen. God will fulfill the second part of verse number 47. The Bible says, And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. But it wasn't until the church got to the place where it needed to be. And when they got to where it needed to be, Amen, the Lord began to fill people with the Holy Ghost. Hello? Amen. There's two reasons why people don't get the Holy Ghost. Well, I guess maybe three. Third one being they don't want it. Amen. The other two reasons that they don't get the Holy Ghost is number one, the church is not where it needs to be. Hallelujah. My mind just went blank. Amen. Can we stand together this evening?
That's one of those oops moments. Amen. It's either they don't want the Holy Ghost or the church is not where it needs to be. Or the second thing is, is that there's nobody in church that needs the Holy Ghost. Hello? I remember the story told Brother Billy Cole one time. He said he was at a revival and the pastor got up and said, Bless God, Brother Billy Cole's here. Great evangelist. There's going to be 50 people get the Holy Ghost tonight. Brother Billy Cole said there wasn't 50 people in the church that needed the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. They can't get the Holy Ghost unless, and I know you can get the Holy Ghost at home. You can get, I've heard people getting the Holy Ghost in some, in some strange places. But if we're going to see people get the Holy Ghost in the church, there's got to be people that need the Holy Ghost in the church. It's God's will to fill people with the Holy Ghost. I don't care what the world tells us. I don't care what the modern preachers tell us. God is still in the soul-saving business. His blood is still flowing from Calvary, and it's still covering multitudes of sin. People are still going under the water in the name of Jesus Christ and coming up and having the sin burden lift off their shoulders. Amen. There's still people begin to speak in an unknown tongue as the Spirit of God gives utterance when the Holy Ghost fills them with His Spirit. Hallelujah. I'm glad I'm a part of the church of Jesus Christ tonight. Aren't you? Hallelujah. Can we lift our hands and worship the Lord together?